Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for On Rest as Resistance. My name is Alex Elliott, and I'm the Senior Manager of Events and of Integral Studies, which is a nonprofit university located in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those who were forcefully brought to this continent, we CIIS public programs must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupies traditional unceded Ramatush Ohlone lands. If you are interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now let me first introduce our presenters, Trisha Hersey and Damali Robertson, and then we'll get right to their conversation. Damali Robertson is the Dire Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at California Institute of Integral Studies. She began a full-time career in DEI after a 15-year career in progressive nonprofit leadership. From 2008 to 2011, Damali helped pioneer diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives at the Haas Center for Public Service. More recently, she spent a year leading an in-depth racial equity project to address the achievement gap between Black students and their peers at a Bay Area high school. That project motivated her decision to pursue an MA in social justice and organizing. Most recently, she co-led DEI initiatives in the criminal justice space, while also leading their fundraising and communication efforts. Damali grounds her work in decolonial and liberatory praxis. She's also a mindfulness practitioner and circle keeper who approaches everything with a restorative impulse, integrity, lots of deep breaths, and compassion. Trisha Hersey is a Chicago native who has called Georgia home for the last 12 years. She has over 20 years of experience as a multidisciplinary artist, writer, theologian, and community organizer. She's the founder of the Nat Ministry, an organization that examines rest as a form of resistance and reparations by curating spaces for the community to rest via community rest activations, immersive workshops, performance art installations, and social media. Her research interests include Black liberation theology, womanism, somatics, and cultural trauma. She is the author of the upcoming book, Rest is Resistance, a Manifesto, which was just published this October, 2022. You can learn more about her work and the book at thenapministry.com. And now it is my absolute pleasure to turn it over to Trisha and Damali. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, at first, before anything else, I want to say, Trisha, it is my great honor and privilege to talk to you tonight. I feel like I'm talking to you on behalf mm. of all of my Black women, all the Black women who are here in community with me now, but all of those that came before me, my grandmothers and their mothers. So thank you, mm -hmm. Trisha, for this work and congratulations on becoming a New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling tonight? I'm feeling good. You know, I've been really um, keeping my energy together and grounded as much as I can. I'm so excited to be doing this virtual talk with you because um, it's a nice time to have a nice conversation now that the book has been out for a little bit, only a week. So it's been out for like maybe seven, eight days. I don't even know. I'm on the road. I was, I'm in um, LA right now, but I was just in Chicago. So I'm feeling good. I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude. I can't even think of a word to say how thank you thank you. If I said thank you a million times to my ancestors mm. and it created, it wouldn't be enough. So yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I do want to start our conversation uh, in that place, in the ancestral realm. Mm -hmm. I read your book, you know, cover to cover. And one thing that struck me was the way that you lifted up your ancestors in the book. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to start with your father, Willie, yes. Percy. 
yes. and your grandmother aura. And the thing that I thought that I would ask first is how they inspire this work and how you think they're feeling in this moment. Yeah. I know that they're, I know my ancestors love me, you know, like I don't have a doubt. I love them so much. So there's this mutual deep connection and love. Um, I was raised in the black church, the Pentecostal denomination. My dad was a minister in the black church. And so we believe that, you know, death is not the end, you know, it's just the beginning mm. actually. And um, we don't even call funerals funerals. They're called home goings. You're going home, mm. but you're still here. So in the realm with us, you never leave. It's um, always present. So I do feel their presence around me, especially when I was in Chicago where um, they're both um, buried. And so mm -hmm. I was there with my whole family and I always pick up a good um, deep energy whenever I get on that land in, in Chicago and near the lake south side. So I um, am so grateful for both of them and for all of my ancestors. I know for sure they love me. I know for sure that they are resting because of the rest that I'm doing in this dimension. And so it's reparations work. And I know that they um, are very open and overjoyed to know that they haven't been forgotten and that we're still um, being connected and resurrected together um, in dream space. And reclaiming the space that was stolen from them I'm reclaiming it for them so they can rest and we can rest now and so the whole work really started from a deep place of um, ancestor reverence and uplifting what has happened and what has been done to you know my ancestors bodies to their spirits to their their um energy everything and so the examination started with me you know in a black woman's body mm -hmm who was experimenting with deep, a legacy of deep exhaustion. And so um, I feel the connection deeply. I know they are happy. I dedicated the book to my dad. I, I won't stop talking about Aura, my grandmother, the muse of this work, and so many, my great grandmother, Rhody, and my aunts and my, you know, all the people who are in a different realm now still with us. I know that they're happy. Thank you. And I mean, you go into detail about your father, his work, Mm -hmm. and as an activist but mm -hmm. also just his daily work the grind that he was in yeah. and you also talk about your grandmother it felt like she was pioneering this mm -hmm. rest as resistance with her mm -hmm. daily uh, like her eyes resting those mm -hmm. moments how did that like inform what you've created both in that ministry but also this book yeah, I talk about, you know, this this entire ministry is a historical examination. Like people saw it pop up online and just social media um, in its uh, ways, in its very toxic ways, doesn't allow for things to really have a deep understanding. And so the work really came out of me being an archivist and working in the archives at Emory University and their manuscript um, collection with the African American papers and really being able to touch and hold and study and cultural trauma in the Jim Crow South and Jim Crow terrorism and, and slavery. And so the work really, you can't enter into the work without getting into the history because they, 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 it is the work, you know, that's what the work is. And so I think that, um, they informed my work so much because it was for them who I was resting for. I began to rest my body to connect with them. I would get dreams. I talk about the dreams I had in um in the book that I when I would take a when I would sleep, I would have all these dreams with my um with my grandmother and how I felt like this work really came to me in a dream. And so this work is the creation of a woman who was exhausted and but very curious mm -hmm. but she her freedom came through not being exhausted so this work couldn't have come out of an exhausted mind so the more I rested the more I connected the ideas and my ancestors gave me kind of the guide um to be able to see this work as a real commitment to, um, to their reparations thank you and you know I have a confession and I'm sure you've heard this before mm -hmm. but a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, attended a NAP ministry event in Oakland, probably like three, four, it's been a while. And mm -hmm. I remember when she described what was, you know, what she had entered and mm -hmm. like the freedom that she felt. I just felt like 
Well, I don't know if that's possible for me. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think I hear you. I hear yeah. what you feeling that it yeah. was wonderful. Mm-hmm. But listen, I'm too busy. You know, yeah. I was in that place. I ain't got the time. And then, mm-hmm. you know, lately, um, I've really decided, I think your book supported me. But mm-hmm. before I decided, I, I really need to do this. Yes. I need to invest in this rest joy pleasure yes but I, but I didn't start there so I no. want to just ask about the folks who were like me who who you're, feel you're, like you're I in good company space. you're in good company you're you're in company with most of the world <laughs> you know so there's a lot of people I mean this is an outlier movement this movement is not in any way shape or form like mainstream and I, I'm so grateful for that I give thanks every day for that this is a real underground outlier um community care you know art intervention that is um, really on the ground and hands-on. And so I think that the book, I'm so happy for it to be published so that people can have a field guide. They can have this care manual that they can carry with them as they're experimenting in their communities and as they're trying to unravel from the grips of capitalism. So I'm not surprised that anyone would um, listen to this idea and be like, oh, that sounds great. Because if you've been bamboozled and brainwashed since birth and socialized into this idea of capitalism and white supremacy of course of course you would not see your rest as something valuable or see your rest as something that is your divine and human right because we've been trained since birth sometimes even before birth I talk about that in the book about my son Mm -hmm. on this rush this white cult of supremacy white supremacy cult of urgency of rushing of perfection of always doing of connecting our divine human worth to how much we get done and I think we need to sit in how violent and destructive and toxic that idea is that we look at a divine human body a miracle you know and we see it and degrade Mm -hmm. its divinity and see it as only something that is a tool to do things to accomplish a tool of production for a system um doesn't deserve or um, need rest or care or joy or pleasure like The fact that we feel guilt and shame when it comes to resting tells us at the crisis that we are in, um, we're past a crisis. We're really in deep, um, dark waters when it comes to our ideas of who we are and what the systems has done to us on such a spiritual level when it comes to our own self-worth, like it's robbed us of that. And so this work really is an invitation to be more human. Mm -hmm. If I can put it in a concise, you know, distilled way, that's really what the work is. Thank you. I mean, in the book, you say that grind culture is violent. Yes, it is. And I would love to hear you unpack that some more because so many people kind of resist that word violent. Mm -hmm. Like there's something that comes up like, but I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And I would just love to hear you say more about why you think it's violent. Mm -hmm. Well, violence comes in many forms. And so Mm -hmm. This culture, this whole culture is founded on violence. So this is a culture of violence. We that's where you live. And so to be uncomfortable about me calling something within a culture of violence, violence just is something that we're gonna have to meditate and sit with and, and start to begin to heal from this um toxic curriculum of white supremacy and capitalism. It's toxic. And I also talk about the history of, of this whole work and it goes back to um, you know, the American South and um where my ancestors were enslaved on plantations. Capitalism was created on plantations. And I think people got to sit with that and understand what a plantation was and what was happening in these sites of terror, you know, and Mm -hmm. what was going on for centuries and centuries. The American sin of slavery is something that we still haven't reckoned with. And to know what was going on um, and happening to the bodies there. I'm talking about indigenous people as well, African people, like what was happening in those places Mm -hmm to be able to experiment with a system that could automate a human being, that could see profit over people, that could try to um, become an economic engine. You know, the amount of money that was being made on people in the South picking cotton, agricultural money. Cotton was such a rich agriculture that they called it white gold. So if you were a grower in the South of cotton, you were, um, they would say, oh, you got that white gold. You know, it was that um, valuable and so much money. And so when I think about the the, the engine that drove that, the engine that drove, you know, enslaving human beings and 
killing them and just like the, the evils of slavery um it's the same energy that's happening today i don't know why it's, it's just morphed and changed it's got contemporary but the way capitalism um abuses and exploits bodies and abuses the labor of black and brown women and men in this culture the way uh capitalism and just collaboration between white supremacy is what grind culture is and so grind culture wants us all working 24 hours a day seven days a week. it doesn't see you as human and so mm -hmm. that is the ultimate form of violence to me for someone to not see you as a human being mm -hmm. thank you and i mean your book does such a good job i mean it's an amazing job of representing the voices by bringing in testimonies and yeah. stories and I mean, I was just enamored and feel like I have a lot more research that I want to yes. do, but yes. you unearthed something for me that I hadn't been aware of. I am Jamaican and mm -hmm. American, mm -hmm. and as a Jamaican, I've heard about the Jamaican Maroons. Always, lot, yes. yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Jamaican Maroons, Jamaican Maroons. Always. I didn't know yes. about American Maroons. Absolutely. So I wanted you to talk about American That's, Maroons. They are, I name it in the book as one of the greatest inspirations for this type of liberation work for me. I found out about them like very late in my life too. Um, I talk about that in the book that I, I was an organizer and um, a lot of you know, major um, organizing campaigns all over the country. I, have, I was raised an organizer, I'm a historian, I'm an archivist, and I had not heard about wow. the American Maroons. It's such a history that has been erased. Um, like they erased so much of um, black and indigenous history in this culture. And so that I found out that when I was at a um, Black Land and Liberation um, organizing and the woman came and presented um, this book to us as one of the organizing strategies when it comes to really creating these um, alternative and spiritual and physical places of freedom via um, land. And so these were Black farmers I was working with and people who were growing food and really into the land, um, um, reclaiming the land so they can grow on it and feed families and communities. And so, yeah, this the Maroons are, I don't even want to give it away because I want people to read about them and I want them to read the book, yes. um, Slavery's Exiles. These were Black folks jumping off slave ships before they, um, when they got to shore, they was already planning to jump off subversive, inventive people leaving plantations and never once looking back and never going back, like not fugitives, but literally they just decided they weren't going to be a part of the system. And they lived in caves and in trees and in the mm -hmm. bush and all these places in Virginia and Georgia and Mississippi. And so the African, the African, the North American Maroons are my, one of my greatest inspirations. And so in the back of the book, there's a Nat Ministry library and it names the books you know, some of the books, I can't name them all yeah. the pages, but some of the books that have been particularly focused on grounding um, this experimentation and rest, because it is an experimentation, the whole idea, the framework, the praxis has been me experimenting on my own body, but also working with the community and collaboration and um, deepening into the eye of community care and using the organizing principles I was um, raised doing and knowing and adding theology into it, adding performance art, installation, adding um, community organizing and spirit work. So it it has the, the potential to be something you could study forever. And I've been reading a book for seven years. This book called wow. Womanist Theological Ethics. I've been in it for seven years, taking my time, tapping it, writing. So I think slow research, hmm. slowing down, not being in book competitions where you're reading a book a month, and, you know, yeah. like just really like becoming a curious um, researcher and witness about your own life and doing mm. that by carrying around a notebook, handwriting things, going into books and taking your time. So I want people to write in my book, underline, highlight, read it in community with other people and book groups, just people in their family, like really see it as a um, field guide for the movement. Yeah, I mean, your book, we have it on a reading list that we have from my office, but I keep talking about it in every possible space because nice. of the history, like mm -hmm. the fact that you have told us some things that I think, like you said, has been wiped away yeah. uh, by mainstream dominant culture. Yeah. And so I just, as many people 
to read this book. I'm like, please thank you. Read yes. this book. <laughs> um, I also want to talk about uh, some of the other luminaries that you mentioned in your book and Harriet Tubman being like really first yeah. among them, but bell hooks, mm -hmm. Dr. King, right? And in the mention of Harriet Tubman, it's in the spirit of freedom and yes. the ability to follow your intuitive guidance. Yes. And so do you think intuition is a portal to freedom? And if Absolutely. so, why? Absolutely. Yes. I think, I think sleep is a portal to freedom. And I think your intuition deepens when you um, are well rested, when you sleep, when you dream, when you slow down when you have silence, like our body is this site of liberation. It's just uh, this teacher that wants to share so many things with us, but we're so noisy and so like disconnected, um, call ourselves being connected. We're connected on technology, but disconnected from the technology of our own bodies. And so the disconnection is deep in our own, in our bodies because our body has its own technology. And so people um, really understanding that this work is a slow unraveling. I call it a meticulous love practice. So I say, mm. this is a meticulous love practice that will be a lifelong um, shift that will be happening for the rest of your days. Um, and for that, I give so much thanks for that. I don't want to be rushed. I don't want to be quick, trying to be quick on this. That's that's the part of the issue now is that we're always so rushed, so quick, so consuming, always consuming, can't stop. And that's just part of the beast of um, white supremacy and capitalism that has trained us to be in this like numbed, quick, overworked, zombie place because when it's, when you're like that, you're easier to manipulate, I think. And so I think mm. the more we can tap into our intuition, our dreams, I call this work freedom dreaming, like to dream yourself free. Um, sleep and intuition are very closely um, tied to each other. Um, and I think that part of that is the listening. When I talk about my grandmother, Aura, and she similar to Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman was stopping along the Underground Railroad to pray. She, I mean, she got the, can you imagine like the bounty on her head and all the dogs? Mm. She, she was never caught once, but she was stopped at moments by trees and around different nature areas, rivers, and just stopped to pray to get a word on go left or right. So her mm. deep intuition of the stars and the sky and the um, bird sound, she was also a birder and knew, was very particular about bird sounds and could like identify mm. birds all throughout her journey. She was, um, deeply into sky gazing and an astrologer so she could follow the north star so to be in tune with things that are outside of these phones that are outside of the noise and to go into the internal intuition and also with the intuition that the earth wants to provide to us I think all of that is going to come when we go into a slow down state thank you in the book you also talk about radical community care and you know this society in particular is very individualist. It's about the individual. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you talk about what radical community care looks like. Yeah. Why it it's so important? It looks like, it looks really like accepting. Like it's going to be um, a grief moment. I, I like this. I talk about grief a lot in the book, but I always like to uplift grief and rest kind of being collaborators with each other but it's going to be a grieving moment that this society and this culture is going to have to go through before they can jump to the next step we always want to rush everything and tell me how to get to the next step like you're really going to have to sit in this for a little bit that you've been manipulated since birth by a system that does not see you as a human being by a system that has it's alignment in terror, violence, you know, um, the transatlantic slave trade, indigenous killing indigenous people. Like the history of the system that we're, we were born into and what it has done to our um, beings as human beings, as divine humans, it's really something that people need to sit with a little bit. And that's part, I think, of the resting practice. So I talk about in the book how to curate a rest practice, how to begin to slowly unravel and uncover and accept and um, deprogram and just take your slow time and have mercy and grace to yourself to understand that this is going to be a lifelong um, experience and that you have to give grace because the, the engine continues to go. 
And so you got to be like the Maroons. You got to be subversive mm -hmm. and flexible and inventive and imaginative. You got to just make it happen. You know, you have to snatch rest and, and um, really begin to work with each other. We won't be able to do this work alone. So the community care piece is deep for this work. I don't mention self-care one time in the book. It's 55,000 words. And I, do, I did that intentionally oh, because okay. I want to uplift community care communal care the self has been lifted up enough the individual has been lifted up enough we're not going to survive without each other that's just where our interconnectedness is so deeply tied that this rest work has to be done in collection and community and uh, communal with each other it started that way um it's the way liberation work is always done healing can't be done alone you know, healing justice can't be done alone. And so the deepening of that is that you have to make space for yourself to rest, but you also have to look at this work. It's not just an invitation to lay down. It's not just about laying down. If you're a racist, if you're a um, homophobe, if you're, you know, deeply into patriarchy, upholding that, if you're um, all the anti-Black, all these rests and naps are not going to save you. You know, <laughs> this work mm -hmm. is about mm -hmm. decolonizing your alignment with these systems, beginning to see straight, beginning to wake up from the um, numbing out that has happened as being part of a culture that is 24-7, never paused, overworked, burnt out bodies. And so this is a slow connection to decolonize and come back to your humanness. And so the community care pieces that we're going to have to do this together because um, we're all going to be um, connected whether we want to or not. Martin Luther King Jr. says it's this, when this fabric, we're tied together whether we want to or not. You know, he mm -hmm. talks about this deep interconnectedness of our, um, of our culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, another thing you say is that we can't wait for permission, the systems, no. for the systems to give us permission. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are, there are people waiting, oh, when my job does this, yeah, when this thing they're happens. They're not going to. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the thing, right? They're not going to. So no. you're saying, mm -hmm. do it now, right? Look, that's your wisdom. Yes. Yeah. The, the time to rest is now. The time to get your freedom is now. The time to disrupt and push back against these uh ancient toxic systems it's time you know to do it now and so that's where it kind of lies in this um activist work and this work around spirit work and the idea that this is a spiritual practice and so why are we waiting for anything external to tell us about anything um that's in, in us you know we don't need to listen to the weight on the system to tell us anything we already know the way our bodies know better our bodies um no they keep the score they know what's happening they have our body is this connection to the divine so the more we can care for it slow down um with it love on it um bring it back to its human state and get it away from the machine level pace um the more we'll be able to deepen you know into this work in a, in a slow slow way thank you and i think you're also like so honest in this book that you know it's always a risk to go against dominant culture. Absolutely. Like, you better be. Yes. <laughs> you going to be at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and my thing is, I think I've learned that myself. And there's a lot of fear. I feel yeah. like there's a lot of fear. Survival mode is up for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Do you have any wisdom about uh, for someone who's working to find that courage to, to rock the boat a little bit? <laughs> any I think, wisdom? I think slow down and rest more. Like I know this sounds, but literally, even if it's 10 minutes a day, even if you don't jump on your phone as soon as you wake up and you do some detoxing of technology, we are the master teachers, our body knows. And so I want people to understand the more you can get in touch and slow down enough that you can connect with your body and mind. That's what resting is, is slowing down you enough so that you can connect that slowly and surely you'll come back to your humanness and you'll begin to feel human because this body is divine. It's a site of liberation, which is like the second tenet of the ministry to really deepen into the idea that the work is to rest. There is no extra, the work is to rest, rest. And anything that you want that um, is talking about liberation, we have to have rest as the center of it. We won't get to um, liberation from exhausted bodies and mind, nothing nothing generative can come from exhaustion and um rest is a generative state of freedom and so my answer is always when can you slow down more how can you slow down to the wisdom that your body already holds inside how can you connect more with what already has happened you know connecting to history i think those are the ways that you will begin to um 
lessen the fear, you know, and begin to even leap when you're still scared. You know, like when I talk about my family, they leap without a net all the time. You know, that radical mm. faith to them, it felt like mm. dancing to do that. that. That's, you know, to leap without a net, they was always making a way out of nowhere. And so dig deep and go into the cracks of your own understanding and your own origin story and in the beauty and power of us working together of your own community build community with each other mm -hmm. and you do talk about radical faith in the book what is the distinction in your mind between faith and radical faith mm -hmm. i mean i think they faith alone is just a full-on leaping it's a, i think the word radical comes from the root so the word radical means mm -hmm. at the root mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i think radical to me means a sustained faith a faith that is kind of unmovable unshakable you know mm -hmm. it's not it's not the type of faith that is attached to things that have happened that make you believe it's literally just I'm, i have faith that this is going to be good you know and you have this deeper spiritual connection to someone outside of you to the earth to whatever your um path is to your own hearts you know to your own breathing to your own body and so i think the radical nature is that it gets deep and deep into the root it stays there it reminds me of um alice walker's quote about womanism when she said mm. irregardless like irregardless of what i'm gonna get free you know like when harriet Tubman said freedom or death like when mm. she was walking those roads trying to walk to freedom with um all of her comrades it was it was no it was freedom or death and so i think that radical faith can be something that feels like a soft blanket that you mm -hmm. surrender to that this rest movement is really about the softening it's about softening it's about the softening it's not about mm -hmm. tough hard rush rigid it's flexible it's um intuitive you know it's slow it's soft it's um it's pervasive in a way that um, is unmovable. And so I think the more we can deepen into that, what resting is, um, the deeper this freedom will come for us. I love that idea of softening. Um, the other thing that you explore in the book and you really share about is Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned a lot of the folks like Octavia Butler and mm -hmm. all of that, that work, but it really did cause me to think about what would be possible for us if we took away the barriers mm -hmm. and really imagined into yes. what's possible, the change that's possible. Can you say more about how Afrofuturism has inspired this work and well, your work generally? I think that I will say about that is not a lot of people have studied Afrofuturism. So I will offer that people, they're on YouTube. Mm -hmm. YouTube has such an amazing collection of Sun Ra, S-U-N, Sun Ra, R-A, the um, father, the grandfather of Afrofuturism, a, a filmmaker, a deep, beautiful, improv jazz musician, like brilliant. Um, he's an ancestor now, but his orchestra um, still plays. And so really deep into Sun Ra and his films, his movies, his um, music, his writings, there's so many documentaries out about him, um, spaces, the plays. Um, a, a black planet like this idea of imagining so there is a, a part of the book is called imagine so the book is broken up into four parts mm. and imagination and imagining is so important for this work that I gave it its own part so I have a whole section where I just deepen into the idea of imagination and how bell hooks will call it a tool one of the greatest tools of oppressed people is to have imagination to be able to imagine your way um, to freedom to be able to sit and dream up and imagine a world that you want to see and so i love that quote from her i love people deepening slowly into research like i've been researching this work for over 10 years but it really at the end of the day is the collaboration of 25 years of um of being an artist of being a poet a writer of being raised by um a black preacher who was also you know deeply into the black panther party a union organizer my dad and really the black church as one of the centers you know studying theology studying somatics and really just slowly not rushing the ideas and understanding that this work is just beginning that it will be expanded upon that people will use this document 
and um, also begin to experiment more with their bodies about what, what rest can do for you them. Because at the end of the day, we can talk about it for 300 more hours. At the end of the day, you're just going to have to lay down. Like, and you're going to have to have the praxis and the practice of seeing what rest can do for your body and closing your eyes and, and really embodying this work. So it's embodied work. Thank you. And you mentioned our addiction to social media in the book and the fact that you step away from it, you detox. Um, and I'm like, I'm going I'm to take a note and work on that myself. But one of the things that I thought after I was reading some of what you shared in the book about social media is if we, if, if folks can create a metaverse, mm -hmm. if, you know, there can be all these things that we do with technology, there can be more done toward our well-being toward and in racism and homo I mean I feel like there's an opening to imagine mm -hmm. on the side of social media do you mm -hmm. see any possibilities like that especially mm -hmm. if you look at it through an Afrofuturist lens oh no, I don't I, I mean many people would disagree with me but I am a purist when it comes to that okay. I believe in ancient communication I believe in uh, the civil rights movement being done in basements of churches by word of mouth and look what they did you know I feel like technology is just driving us deeper and deeper into exhaustion that I talk about that in the book it was not created um, it was created as a, a function of capitalism as an extension mm -hmm. of capitalism so I myself don't think capitalism is irredeemable it's redeemable in any way and so no I think that we're going to have to I say that I put our laptops down put our cell phones down go back to the ancient technology of our bodies, of connecting one-on-one -on -one with people, of vintage communication, writing, you know, calling on a landline phone, analog, you know, visiting, building communities with each other. Now, I know that social media in itself is, I talk about this being, a, um, there's a two different things, it's nuance, you know, they has brought a lot of people together. Technology has its pluses it's been able to uh, remix and allow a lot of communities to connect deeply with each other, which is so important. But for this rest message, for this idea, I am a purist and I am going back to, if you read what I'm, if you read what I'm influenced by, you'll say, I get why she's not into that. So you have to go read the book and get the library in the back and kind of take your time and deepen into my ideas there. Um, they're um, in a lot of ways asking for us to imagine a new world. Th and that includes not metaverse, all of that is it's a world now. So we, we, we have something that's outside of that. So it has to be mm. a new world that doesn't even include any of that because that's that's there. And so that's what this work ultimately is. It's, it's, it's some work that's really asking for the impossible. And that's what a good manifesto does. It kind of um, calls for the impossible. It's for the impossible. I love that you say you're a purist mm -hmm. and that that yeah, it resonates. Yeah. I want to ask you something about boundaries, though, because, you know, you detail in the book about the ways that you've set boundaries, like even your Sabbaths and your times away. And folks still seem to find a way to say, well, can you do this? Mm -hmm. When, you, you know, like this thing and it's mm -hmm. connected to me to this uh, notion of urgency that everybody has. So where do you think, uh, like, two questions, really, it's like, why do you think we should do away with this idea of urgency yeah. and like why do you think it's so hard for people to respect boundaries because the entire culture has never taught us or modeled boundaries or consent and so mm. it goes back to knowing where you live and knowing the history of what white supremacy as an ideology is I think we for whatever reason maybe it's too painful ignore that and really don't just sit with that for a little bit and really research and deepen into that the curriculum of white supremacy the ideology of it is what we've been taught since birth that this is why we decolonize because we have been colonized to think all of these things that are false about our bodies ourselves urgency is one of the main tenets of white supremacy work culture along with perfectionism along with the written word being more important than verbal, you know, communication, like all of these ideas that are on a binary, you know, this binary is going to kill us. The idea that it's either this or that, when there's so much flow and fluidity and imagination that exists in our bodies, in our communities, that this rigid idea of what we should be doing, this rigid idea of this system is not in any way sustainable. Um, it's not caring. It does not care. And so that goes back to the idea of really deepening into understanding where you live and what this is and what it means for your life. And so that you're not 
um, surprised and can't understand why they wouldn't want me to rest because they want you on because the, they don't that's not what capitalism calls for capitalism calls for you to be a machine and so you as a human want to rest and that's why it'll never give you a moment to rest and so deepen into the idea of what how how violent and pervasive this is and understand that everything you learned about um things around care labor your body um everything really has been influenced by a toxic system and influenced by you know a lot of brainwashing that's not true about who you are and so the truth about who you are is that you are enough now that um the, the systems can't have you that you don't ultimately belong to them from a spiritual sense you don't belong to them at all that you can imagine a new way and you can um you have the divine power um, and energy your body is this beautiful site of liberation wherever it's at you can find it you can tap into that and so to just know and, and settle into the thing of someone saying to you thank you for living you know thank you for being here for resting for resisting for you know speaking truth to power you know um thank you for wanting to find care and love wanting to find rest you know wanting to like know that I don't know exactly what the end gonna look like but I know it ain't this and so this prophetic hope of imagination this idea of what could be true um if you can imagine it and I think that the more we can sit in that and understand that that is totally counter um intuitive to what's happening now to begin to integrate that we've been you know brainwashed and so I started the net ministry social media part because I particularly wanted to be a, a tool to help people to begin to deprogram so I was very intentional about how I was going to work with social media and use it as like a propaganda machine that I can be able to put out these beautiful messages you are enough go lay down the systems can't have you you are beautiful go rest all of these propaganda messages that I'm using to help um one of the many things I'm using to help deprogram people and to get them back centered to again being human thank you and I have just one final question before we go to our audience questions you know in the book you do talk about how you started this on faith like it was a lot of ways radical faith and that intuitive knowing and that you were in the in the midst of school mm -hmm. and so many things that could be um could have distracted you from this could you just share how faith informed this walk and the work that you're doing it was it was it was rest of death you know I was I was killing myself um, from being exhausted it was a sleep deprivation is a real thing it, it affects our health our health our mental health our actual body health um everything about us is like off kiltered and not supported when we are sleep deprived and exhausted and so it, it wasn't a, a thing where I'm going to choose this it was more like mm -hmm. there is no other way I want freedom I'm connected to freedom I don't want death I don't want exhaustion I know that there's something else and so it simply was me just taking it day by day I did not have any idea that it would be what it is I did not mm -hmm. know if it will work it was basically just doing what all black women do before them they see an issue and they try to solve a problem within the own realms of their understanding and they experiment and they um, make things happen. So I just kept experiments and I kept trusting my body and trusting the creator and trusting my ancestors more than I trusted the systems. Mm, thank you. I feel like that's so valuable for so many of us to hear. And mm. so now I'm going to turn to a few questions from our audience. First one is for those trying to find work, trying to make ends meet or suffering under the expectations of most organizations in this country. Do you have any advice for how to rest during this time when feeling like we have to constantly hustle to try and get new work before we run out of money? This is literally the heartbeat of this whole work. I probably have gotten this question a million times and I write about it extensively in the book. So I want to uplift Marcus Bookstore is um, hosting and um, supporting as the bookseller that you really support independent bookstores and this beautiful bookstore and get this manifesto, listen to it, read it and go slow. Do not rush it. Um, don't think you have to get the answers immediately, like reread it. I, I constantly repeat myself in it. Like there's a lot of intentional repetition. And so I think this question just uplifts the idea of what a crisis we're in um it, it, it's a, a very valid 
in desperate question that I know myself, how would I ever, you know, slow down if I don't like the system has taught us that has taught us that if there's only two choices, there's either work like a um, human machine, grind, be exhausted and sleep deprived, spiritually dead, physically sick, or work like, and never do, never work always, never have, you know, so it's like, there are more than two options. There's more than just resting or either working. This can be integrated. And so this is a question where we need to just take a deep breath and understand that my grandmother had eight children and was working two jobs and um, was a Jim Crow survivor from um, seeing lynchings in the South. Eight children, two jobs mm. in Chicago. Mm. She was resting for 30 minutes to an hour every day, closing her eyes. And so in the book, I uplift these ideas of how we have to be flexible and reimagine rest. And so the answer to that is just to reimagine rest, that we're going to have to reimagine what rest is and understand that it can be integrated into our daily lives, that we can be imaginative and the first step is just going to be slow steps slowing down. And so there's a whole bunch of tips, ideas about what rest can look like. And it's all in the book. Thank you. Another question is um, from the audience. We know how vital rest is for healing. And yet at the same time, so many trauma survivors struggle with what shows up in their body and psyche, like memories, sensations, et cetera, when they try to rest or slow down. How might you invite people carrying somatic trauma stress in their being to wade into rest practices in a way that may decrease the likelihood of a practice that could support healing inadvertently, inadvertently feeling triggering? This is the question of your body is the teacher. <laughs> like I'm not the teacher. I'm not trying to, your body is the greatest teacher. And so your body, your histories, your origin stories, your past traumas, your collective traumas, your personal traumas are all part of the memory in the, in the, um, the story your body has to tell. So listen to your body. Your body wants what it wants when it comes to um, what it needs to care for itself. And so I would just say, find things that align with you. Like I talk about in the book about taking ballet classes and that'd be one of the deepest forms of rest for me. I was taking um, a high level ballet class in graduate school on the bar and a pianist on um, playing every, and it was just like the deepest form of rest. And it was active rest. I was moving my body. I was stretching, you know, I love um, walking. I love um, things listen to music, you know, yoga, stretching. There's so many practices when you think about what resting is. And so that question um, uplifts the idea that we really don't know where rest is. No one in this culture does because it mm -hmm. hasn't been taught to us. And so resting is the idea for us to reimagine. It can be so many things. It can be what you make it. And so it can mm -hmm. also be active. It's, there's, there's infinite things. And so I think because uh, as a culture, we've been so limited in our thinking we've been taught that there isn't enough of anything that this is what it is and so to tap into the idea of imagination and, and me saying to someone you can make it what you want like that may seem scary to a person because they've never been given that freedom mm -hmm. over their own bodies in a culture like this that tries to run your bodies and own it like we're still on plantations and so I'm saying to you that your body and your energy and what's in you is yours your body is the teacher it's the one that needs to be listened to and mm -hmm. collaborated with and, you know, managed and kind of flowed with. And so go deep into your body and whatever that tells you is um, that connects you is what rest can be. Thank you. <clears throat> Another audience member wants to know, how does rest as resistance connect to biblical jubilee cycles of land and wealth returning? What dreams of Jubilee do you have when you rest? I mean, to me, I think the ultimate liberation is when we're ultimately have freedom and autonomy to speak and do and um, connect in the most human way possible. And so liberation to me is getting us back to just being a human being, a divine dwelling place. Um, the place where divinity um, resides. And so I think that liberation and that jubilee can look like so many things. Like 
the binary, the this has to be this way or that way, the deep, deep rigidity of our culture is part of um, our brainwashing around what we think um, we can be. It's part of like why this work is so important. This work is not just about naps or resting. It's I say that millions of times mm -hmm. and I'm hoping when the book, people can read the book that they, I'll repeat it so much that it becomes something they can slow down enough and begin to I unpack a lot about why this is about more than naps. And I want people to um, see it as a political movement. Um, it is a social justice movement. It is not about wellness. It's literally resisting toxic systems by pushing back the arrest. And so the main tenet of the NAP ministry is that uh, rest is a form of resistance because it disrupts and pushes back against white supremacy and capitalism. It offers repair. It offers um, a, a re-resurrection. And so in that way, I think everybody you know black mm -hmm. folks everybody's bodies being able to be seen as divine is the is the key to jubilation to me and what i think when i dream about ultimate liberation is that is that there are no external uh things that are holding us back from who we truly are who we are and whose we are so there's this expansive imagination about what is possible because another world is possible, you know, another, um, poss another freedom is possible. Another world is possible. The world that we live in right now has been dreamed up, systematically created, um, supported and, you know, like funded, you know, by some people who came together and saw that they wanted to create a system that was not equal, that didn't have justice for everyone, that was um, deeply rooted in a white supremacist ideology. And so that same way that that has been created, we can create um, a new way. We can imagine uh, imagine ourselves free and begin to tap into these inventive ideas. And so the inventive ideas will come. I trust rest. Mm. You got to trust it. You got to leap. You have to just trust it, even if it's for 10 minutes. And so I ask that in the book that people just slow down. They even want the answers to how to get to rest in three second bullet points and that'd be the end of it. This is no, that's not what I call this decolonizing work. This is a lifelong, meticulous, uh, very um, strategic, intentional practice of, of disrupting and um, healing from the trauma that we have as human beings living in this culture, spiritual trauma, um, emotional trauma, the trauma of disconnection, the trauma of believing white supremacy, the, 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 the trauma of being caught up in the grips of capitalism so hard, like I was, like my entire family was, and some still are, that how deep the system is and the grips are. And so I, I want to offer to people that they allow the words and the energy to come to them intuitively, slowly, they carry a notebook, they have dreams, they write it down, they sleep more, they, they um, get off technology when they can, they make it possible to be able to have space to just be. And so I think I'll end on that, that like the space to just be is so important, the space to just not be caught up in trying to figure everything out, to be able to be perfect, to be able to make this amount of money and do these accomplishments is a space to just be, you were not born and become a miracle to just be um, on this planet, to just be accomplishing and doing stuff. Like your birth also grants you rest and pleasure and love and joy and care and connection. And so I just want people to remember that, that your birth grants you that. And so we have to com come together as a community and begin to um, be deeply um deeply in our faith walk and deeply in our um, resistance walk to be able to soften into the idea of just slowing down thank you and we did have one more question from the audience are you feeling that there would be space for one more um uh, i think we had to wrap at 55 so i'm okay. not sure yeah i think i would say the book most of the questions that people yeah. have asked me over the course of this book tour this is my i'm in the third city i was in New York, Chicago, and now I'm in LA, then I'm moving on to um, DC. I would say 100% of the questions that people have been out in the book. And so I'm very excited for people to, um, this book is like right hot off the presses for them to be able to listen to it on Audible, to sit mm -hmm. and slowly read it. I've been getting pictures from people who've like underlined so much already with their highlighter, they've oh. written in the book. Yeah, 
post-it notes. I like, I love writing the book, use it as that type of a manual. Like, don't be afraid to write and underline and really engage with this work in a slow way. Read a sentence and then go take a nap. Read, Thank a, you. read a paragraph and then just go daydream, you know, mm -hmm. just do a daydreaming moment. It doesn't always have to be about resting. Um, resting can be, is everything. Resting is daydreaming, it's silence. And so the mm -hmm. book reveals the idea of this expansive reimagination about what rest can be in our lives. And so go through the book slow and um, take your time and, and expand on an experiment and understand that you have a lifetime. It doesn't have to be rushed. Thank you so much. And I know that this book will cover everything from end to end, the process, including the grief that might come up as you go through it and the joy that you find. Trisha, yeah. this conversation has been so illuminating. It has been so warm and heartfelt. Mm -hmm. And I know that I learned so much and so many of our viewers, the people who are tuning in have learned from you. So thank you so for your glad. time. Thank you for your work. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation. It's been a joy. So keep resting, keep you know <laughs> trying to make it happen. Keep being inventive around your time and your body is yours to invent and experiment with. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to turn it back to Alex. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you. Alex, turn it back to you. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded tonight, so if you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We are also going to feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.